We can see how important real-time communication is by looking at the history of undersea communication cables. In 1854, the American entrepreneur Cyrus Field spearheaded efforts which spanned more than 14 years and ultimately cost over $12 million, approximately $150 million in today's currency. Key scientific and engineering contributions were made by Sir William Cook, Sir Charles Wheatstone, Michael Faraday, and Professor James Clerk Maxwell. Cyrus got permission to lay a well-insulated line across the Atlantic floor, and with the help of the British and American naval ships, he tried four times to complete the project, but unfortunately failed each time. Despite many setbacks, the Atlantic Telegraph Company finished the first transatlantic submarine telegraph cable using the new miracle material Gouda Parcha, which was wrapped three times around seven copper conductor wires, or as we know it today, rubber. This was wrapped even more with tarred hemp and an 18-strand helix of iron wires. In July 1858, the Agamemnon, the Valorous, the Niagara, and the Gorgon, four British and American ships met in the middle of the ocean for the fifth time. On July 29th, the Niagara and the Gorgon left for Trinity Bay, Newfoundland, with their load of cable, and the Agamemnon and the Valorous left for Valentia, Ireland. By August 5th, the cable had been successfully laid, stretching nearly 2,000 miles across the Atlantic at a depth of more than two miles. On August 16th that year, Queen Victoria sent President Buchanan a congratulatory telegram. She said she hoped it would be an additional link between the nations whose friendship is based on their shared interests and mutual respect. The president said in response, It is a more glorious victory because it helps more people than any victory won on the battlefield. May the Atlantic Telegraph, with God's help, be a way to keep peace and friendship between countries that are close to each other, as well as a way for religion, civilization, freedom, and the law to spread around the world. These messages were the sign that everyone should be excited. The next morning, 100 guns were fired in New York City as a grand salute. Flags were put up the streets, church bells were rung, and the city was lit up at night. Unfortunately, though, the cable was too weak. It didn't have enough power, and it stopped working by September of that year. These first cable systems cost a lot of money. The service was too expensive for most people to use because of how much it costs to build and run. To use telegraph systems on land, people had to work at repeater stations, where they recorded incoming messages and typed them into the next section of cable. The service was both very expensive and prone to mistakes. Few of the people who ran these repeater stations in Asia spoke English as their first language. Because of this, up to one-third of the messages would have words that were wrong. In the years that followed, techniques and procedures improved, and signal processing got better to increase the capacity of these systems. Telephony then replaced telegraph. Valves were replaced by transistors. Rubber was replaced by polymers. However, the basic design remained the same. A copper conductor wrapped in a watertight insulating cover with a steel jacket to protect the cable where it landed in shallower water. Usually, the cable is laid on the seabed. However, in areas with a lot of marine activity, the steel-sheathed cable may be laid in a trench that's been dug. And in rare cases, the cable may be laid in a trough that's been cut out of a seabed rock shelf. The way the cables are laid hasn't changed much at all. A cable laying ship takes a whole wet segment, tests it from end to end, and then sets out to lay the cable in a single run. The ship's speed and location are carefully chosen so that the cable can be laid on the seabed without putting it under tension. The ship will then sail the lay path in a single trip without stopping. It lays the cable on the seabed, which has an average depth of 3,600 meters and a maximum depth of 1,100 meters. During laying, the cable is stretched out up to 8,000 meters behind the lay ship. In the 1950s, long-lasting telephone repeaters enabled the use of undersea cables. After vacuum tube repeaters worked for 20 years at 2,000 fathoms, that's 12,000 feet or 3,660 meters, the first transatlantic telephone cable was built. There were 36 lines. Similar underwater systems were constructed between Port Angeles and Ketchikan in Washington, 
as well as between California and Hawaii. A cable was laid from Hawaii to Japan in 1964, stretching 9,816 kilometers. A circuit cable with 128 voices was used. In 1965, a U.S.-France cable was established with the same number of voice circuits. In addition, newer television cables became available and in turn, more transistor voice circuits and repeaters were required. In the 1960s, microwave pipes replaced AT&T's tower-based system. Optical fibers were starting to prove to be versatile and inexpensive. Light rays have a higher frequency and can carry more information than microwaves. In 1967, a team of researchers in Corning, New York, set out with a goal to keep 1% of the light that passed through a mile of fiber optic cable intact. They made this dream a reality in 1970, and by the end of the decade, optical communications had gone global. In the 1970s, Masaru Horiguchi of NTT developed a fiber that worked with Dr. Jim Hasai's laser developed at MIT to improve the technology. In 1978, AT&T, GPO, and Standard Telecommunication Laboratories agreed that within 10 years, they would work to establish new fiber optic undersea connections. The first submarine fiber cable was laid between Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight in 1984. It was five miles with no repeats. Two years later, a 70-mile-long cable with three repeaters was laid in Belgium. This cable had a capacity of 11,500 telephone lines. By 1988, at an Atlantic branch point, a three-fiber cable connected the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. A third fiber serves as a backup out of that junction there. This was equal to the capacity of 40,000 telephone calls. At the time, light signals were converted to electricity. They were then amplified and then sent across the undersea cable. In 1987, Bell Labs created a light amplifier. It was a complex system that made optical amplifiers finally a reality. And for the first time, they could handle more than one frequency at a time. By 1996, they were able to transmit data at a rate of 5 gigabytes per second with the ability to send traffic in the opposite direction for each cable. This aided in rerouting if a fiber failed under the sea. By the year 2000, companies were laying low-cost cables to meet the demands of a growing market. Consumer prices fell quickly as a result of the large numbers of shoppers. Photon amplifiers are used in optical cable repeaters today. They can work at full gain at the bottom of the ocean for 25 years. Light is sent through a short segment of erbium dope fiber. The erbium ions make a light stream coming from the area much stronger. This amplified signal that is sent out has the same direction and phase as the light that is coming in. These things are called erbium dope fiber amplifier units, EDFAs. This is a big change for cables that go under the sea. All the wet segment, including the repeaters, it doesn't care about the carrier signal at all. The equipment at the cable stations at each end of the cable now controls how many wavelengths are lit, how signals are encoded and decoded, and how much space the cable can hold. This has made optical systems last much longer because they can get more use out of the cables by adding new technology to the stations at each end while leaving the wet segment alone under the ocean. In these all optical systems, the wet plant doesn't care about how much each cable could carry. These subsea optical repeater units are made to work for the whole time that the cable is in use without any maintenance. Redundancy is built into the design, so if a repeater fails, the cable's capacity might go down a little, but it's still good to be able to work. Just remember, the sky may always be full of stars, but the sea gives you freedom in a unique and special way. These are interesting things with JC.